so tempting to bear crawl across the stage, <clears throat> but I'm one glass of wine from, away from doing that. Hang on a second. All right, so um, out where I live in Pennsylvania, most of the schoolhouses are surrounded by cornfields. They're very remote rural places, lots of playgrounds around them. And something happened a few years ago. Uh, there was a woman named Narita Bensel. She was in her 50s. She was the principal of an elementary school out near uh, Red Lion, Pennsylvania, which I guarantee none of you have ever heard of. And she was in her office and looked out the window, and, and she saw some gentleman at the front door struggling with the door, obviously didn't know that he had to be buzzed in. So he, she was watching him when a mother and child came to the door, and they were buzzed in, and this gentleman came in behind them. So Norina got up from her desk to go see if he needed some help. She walked down the hall toward him, and as she approached, he reached in his pants and pulled out a machete and came after her. So in that situation, that moment, she had to make a series of instantaneous decisions which were really going to make the difference of life and death, not only for her, but for the hundreds of children in that school. So what Narina did at that moment was lifted her arms up, kind of instinctive, like X shape, and began to back away, maintaining eye contact with this guy. So she backs away. Now remember, this is a woman in her 50s, five foot two, who has never, ever been in a fight in her life. This guy was a former soldier. He's coming after her with a machete, and she's backing away. She gets to her office, and by this point, her arms are, are badly gashed and hacked down to the bone. She gets inside, pulls the door shut, locks it, gives a signal, sound the lockdown, lock down all the doors, and call the police. So the, the alarm goes off to lock down every, do every door of every classroom in the school, but they were just a, a, a beat too late. The kindergartners were getting out to go home, and the kindergartners had already started to come out into the hallway. So this guy turns around and leaves the door and starts going after the children. So Narina Bensel did something I still have trouble saying, but she opened the door and went back out after him. Ran down the hall, and he saw her, turned around again, went after her again, and attacked her so savagely that she fell to the ground with her arms uh, basically incapacitated. He turned toward the children. At that point, Narina comes up off the floor and jumps on his back and circles his back and locks her hands around him forming kind of a human lasso. And so there he is uh, with a bleeding woman on his back who is determined to never, ever let go, and he drops the machete. So he's now covered in blood, drops the machete, and someone else runs over, grabs the machete, and runs away. And something about that moment just ended the fight with him. He just stopped right there. The children were safe. The police came. Narina was rushed to the hospital. They were able to reattach her fingers, and she regained much of the use of her arms is now back at her school again. Um, during the trial, when she was on the stand, she turned around and looked at this man, and she said, you know, I, I put my arms around you to comfort you. And he looked back at her and he said, I, I know. So I went, I went to see her because I just, there's so much that went right and so much that could have gone wrong that afternoon. And the things that she did, she could have screamed for help, she could have fallen down on the floor, she could have balled up, she could have done a lot of things, but somehow, she happened to maintain eye contact with him. She happened to raise her arms this way instead of going down this way. She backed away and drew him away from the classrooms. She knew to not try to tackle him or claw him or punch him, but just to use the one thing she had, which is actually her ability to hug. Your amygdala is there in your brain to stop you from doing unfamiliar actions. If you try to do something for the first time, your brain is screaming at you, don't do this, it's a disaster. So the one gesture that a kindergarten principal was very comfortable with was this circling gesture. So she was able to hug. It was the one thing that her brain was going to sign off. Yeah, let's go with that one. So when I asked her, like, how did you know? How did you know to maintain eye contact and to back away instead of running away and to hug rather than punch? And she's like, I, I don't know. I don't consider myself a hero. And I was like, you know, we've become so detached from what this word means that a woman who just sacrificed her arms and almost her life to save the children of 300 other people doesn't consider herself a hero. And I think the reason why was We've taken this thing, and we no longer really know what it means. We use it all the time, but we don't really know what to attach it to. So one place where they do know was the Greek island of Crete. And that's where I sort of went to get more information. On Crete, Crete is the only place in the world where the resistance began the minute 
the Germans arrived during World War II. Every other country, once the army was defeated, it took months before any kind of civilian uprising behind enemy, enemy lines would unite. But on Crete, before the German paratroopers were even on the ground, these guys are grabbing steak knives and strapping them on a broomstick and running out to fight. Now, I guarantee you, if there's a big bang outside this door in the next few minutes, all of us are not going to react the same way. We're not all smashing the tops off our wine bottles and running to the rescue. <laughs> but yet, somehow, on Crete, this was the instinctive re reply. So instinctive that in one village, when a German search par party showed up, they went in there searching for weapons. And they didn't find any weapons, but they also didn't find any men. So they lined up all the women in the village up against the church wall, and they put a machine gun in front of them and said, you have five seconds. At the end of five seconds, you either tell us where they are or you're dead. And he starts lowering fingers. Five, four, three. Before he got to five, his head was blown off his shoulders and he drops down dead. What had happened was there was a guy named Kosti Patarakis in a neighboring village, and he'd heard about the search. So this guy grabs an old gun with no sights on it, and he comes running from a distance. And when he gets within a quarter mile, you know, you see a German officer in a Cretan village with his hand in the air counting down. Nothing good's coming out of this. <laughs> he drops to a knee, takes aim on a gun with no sights, and blows this guy's head, head off from a quarter mile away. If you guys are familiar with Patrick Lee Firmer, Patty, Patty Lee Firmer, one of the uh, undercover operatives on Crete, he saw this happen. And he said to him, it was one of the most dramatic moments he'd ever seen in the war. And when you ask yourself, how on earth was this possible? What was going on? In some ways, you, you sort of focus on the dramatics, but then you've got to dial down the microscope a little bit more closely, like we do with Norena Bensel, and just think, what exactly physically was happening at that moment that made this possible? And I think what it is is this. You know, most of us have learned to outsource almost everything in our lives. You know, if your house is on fire, you call the police. You call the fire department. If someone steals your car, you call the police. We, we don't even play our own games anymore, right? We, we hire people to play our games, then we hire somebody else to bring a cable to our house so we don't have to actually bother going to the game that we can't be bothered to play. And we hire somebody else to bring us some food that we can eat while we're watching the game that we can't be bothered to either watch or even go to. Right? We outsource everything. But on Crete, for thousands of years, this was a lonely little outpost in the middle of the Mediterranean where there wasn't the ability to outsource anything. There was no standing army, so everybody was a soldier. There was no police department, so everyone is a police officer. There's no school, so everyone is considered a teacher which again is a beautiful, harmonious kind of zen concept, unless like your neighbor, neighbor happens to be kind of a shitty firefighter, you know? If he like doesn't want to get his shoes wet or like, you know, can't find his bucket. You know, the people that you have to rely on have got to be reliable. So what the Greeks believed was just this. Rather than hoping that if your house is on fire that maybe the rock will show up and come walking out of the smoke with your kitten, rather than hoping for that, why not guarantee it? Why not just, instead of hoping that a hero is some extraordinary person who happens to show up at the right moment, why don't you just look at the lowest common denominator of everybody in this room right now? What are all the stock parts that we all share? Take those stock components and elevate them a little bit so that they can actually be capable of accomplishing something extraordinary in a crisis. So what do we all have? Okay, we have a lot of elastic recoil in our bodies. We have incredibly perceptive minds which can pick up and remember lots of things. We have an amazing capacity for endurance, our inbred capacity for endurance. So what the Cretans came up with, what the Greeks came up with, was the Greek art of the hero, and it was based on three things. Strength, skill, compassion, which, again, we look at all major religions, it all comes down to the same thing. It's mind, body, and soul. So what is soul? Soul is a desire, the desire to help, this recognition that your entire kinship network extends everywhere, and that you are stupid if you think that you are an isolated little island somewhere. If you get a third cousin somewhere, who decides as a hobby that he's gonna experiment with crystal meth, at some point, his problem is gonna become your Prius disappearing from the backyard. It's in your interest to understand everything that's going on around you, all those little problems that someday become your problems. So that's number one, that is perception and understanding, it's the desire to help. Secondly is, is strength, this idea of being physically robust enough that you can actually move. But the last and most important thing is skill, and this is where things become really interesting. Because again, we think of the skills as being these arcane things like, you know, like martial arts or like knife throwing or these kind of weird little things, you know, how to disassemble a rifle and put it back together again with your eyes blindfolded. But the Koreans are like, man, it's a lot simpler than this. For most of our existence, for two million years on this planet, the only way we survived and thrived was by being extremely adaptable, by being able to climb and crawl and run and hike and swim and throw and catch 
and defend and pursue. These are very simple things. And if any of you have children under six, you spend most of your time every day telling them not to do that. <laughs> Get down off that. Stop kicking your sister. Put that down. Don't throw that. I told you not to throw that. Over and over again, don't, don't, don't. Yet these are the survival skills that kept us alive for millions of years. So what do we do? We take these super healthy animals. Oh, I got a ton of time. I got plenty more stories. Okay. So what do we do? We take these healthy five-year-old animals and we sit them down in a chair. And so, okay, now sit there for at least 15 years. And then when you graduate, you move over to another chair and sit there for 25 more years. So you take these creatures who are all been spending those first five years of their lives rehearsing these survival skills, these adaptable skills, and you tell them to knock it off. So that later on, when they try and stand up and move, they've lost that ability. So what I became intrigued by is, is it possible to actually regain these skills? And someone else had the same thought. This was a guy named Georges Hebert. You know, Georges Hebert was a French naval officer in the early 1900s, and he was stationed on a, sh a troop ship, troop ship, troop ship off the island of Martinique. And when the volcano on the island exploded, Georges Hebert hops into a lifeboat, and he began steaming towards shore, trying to save people. And what he saw was pretty horrifying. You know, what he saw were tens of thousands of people dying all around him because they couldn't master a couple simple, basic animal movements. Every other creature on the, on the island could find its way to safety. They could swim out, they could crawl out, they could climb, but humans were sort of helpless. What he saw were people who couldn't swim a few yards through the surf to get to the boat, or people who couldn't just pull themselves up a rope a few feet to get onto the boat, or people trying to help their children, trying to pick up a 40-pound child. You know, a 40-pound kid is not that heavy. If I gave you a 40-pound box, no problem. But the problem with bodies are they're, they're kind of unwieldy. You know, they don't have handles or, or balance points. So picking up a 40-pound body is actually kind of tough if you haven't done it, you know, very often. So what Georgia Bear sees is these people are all helpless. Why are we the only animals that just cannot save ourselves? So he went back to France, and he began a little experiment. He took a bunch of other French naval officers, and he began to put them through some basic animal movement tests. Can you get yourself up off the ground? Can you throw something? Can you catch it? Can you knock somebody away? Can you pursue them? And what he found was actually pretty horrifying. Here you actually have trained, conditioned military officers who can't do anything, who just can't function at least half of these normal animal functions. So Georges Hebert came up with a thing he called the natural method. And the natural method was, you know what? Strip away all the crappy cushion Nike stuff, all the compression apparel, all the gym equipment, all the stuff that we've invented because it makes things better. And just get back to basics. Get back to naked animal basics. And regrettably, you know, granted he was French, but they did get back to these little kind of like loincloth-y things, uh, <laughs> which they thought was actually a better way to train. Uh, so when you see pictures of George Hebert's natural movement athletes, you do see some things which are amazing. Okay, cool enough, all right. Uh, you see things which are amazing. Number one, their bodies are not overbuilt at all. Uh, they're not overbuilt and not very muscular, but very supple, lean, and uh, versatile. Um, we also see the fact, too, that it's, old, it's men and women, old and young alike. And one thing that George Hebert really dialed into is one of the major misconceptions we have about strength and skill is it's kind of reserved for bigger, stronger guys. What he understood is, look, there's no way any species would have natural movements that's only reserved for half the species. <laughs> that where things really start to become interesting is when you get rid of all the sports created by men, for men, things which favor upper body strength and uh, power, and you get the things which humans have naturally done for two million years, which is run, hike, crawl, throw, defend, parry, that's where you see the differences between men and women start to diminish. And what I've found really encouraging today is that there's all these underground movements starting to readopt these skills. Parkour, CrossFit, obstacle course racing, these are all things which are stripping away all the nonsense and the crap and the spectator aspects and getting back to this one notion that is really at the heart of what the art of the hero is all about. And it's the two words that George Bear thought should be the motto of everything in your lives, which is be useful. When you exercise, when you eat, when you talk to somebody, are you doing it for the right reasons? Or are you, trying to, are you being useful? Or are you being ostentatious? And that's where he basically said, exercise and health is all about. Am I being useful? Guys, thank you very much for your attention.